Libyan troops on the march. They are lining up to receive medals and thanks from President Gukuni Uwede of Chad, Libya's southern neighbor. Gukuni is happy with the Libyans because it was their intervention that brought a sudden end to a nine-month civil war last December, and Gukuni was the victor. Not everyone is pleased, though. Other African countries in the region remain very suspicious of Libyan intentions. Soon after the end of the war, Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi began speaking openly about a merger between Libya and Chad. There was a chorus of international protest, and little has been heard of the plan since. Recently, Gaddafi has begun withdrawing some of his forces, but thousands still remain. Colonel Gaddafi, of course, says his troops are here by invitation. After all, French troops were called in by these Chadian government forces only a few years ago to hunt down rebels who now form the legitimate government. Gukuni's predecessor as president was Felix Maloum, a Christian and southerner supported by the French, who only finally withdrew from Chad last year. Libya made a significant move southwards in 1973, occupying a disputed border area, the Auzu Strip, and it's given increasing aid to the Muslim northerners who are now in power in N'Djamena. The streets of the capital are now calm, otherwise the Libyans would not have invited foreign camera crews here to shoot film. But it's a battle-scarred city, reflecting the nine months of almost continual warfare between rival factions. There is a long history of conflict between the southern blacks and the northern Arabs, but the May 1980 fighting was between rival Arab factions, involving notably the private armies of Gukuni and the defense minister Hissein Habra. The transitional government of national unity had collapsed in total disarray. Reporters were taken across town to the abandoned residence and headquarters of Habre, whose followers fought under the banner of armed forces of the north. Behind the building is a rough area of swampy land near to the river separating Chad from Cameroon. It's a desolate and unhealthy spot at the best of times, and when the floodwaters receded earlier this year, some grim sights were revealed. This was the killing ground where Habre's prisoners were murdered, say government officials. They've dubbed the former minister the butcher of N'Djamena. The victims were apparently slaughtered last December as Habre prepared to withdraw in the face of a concerted attack by Libyan units. Habre has reportedly regrouped his forces in the east near the Sudan border. In his view, it's the Libyans who are Chad's main enemy. There's a general air of normality on the streets of the capital. But the inescapable fact is that Chad is virtually bankrupt. Public services are almost non-existent, with no proper water supply, no postal services or telephones, and with electricity only in the evenings for a few hours a day. The best place to shop is in the market. There are fresh fruit and vegetables, milk powder and tinned food from Cameroon and Nigeria. But the government has no money to pay for such imports. Instead, individuals and groups have been trading with furniture and fittings looted from abandoned buildings. One local joke is that the government cannot hold meetings because its chairs and tables are piled up on the wrong side of the Chari River. Market trading also reveals another sign of Libyan influence. 
The Libyan dinar circulates freely in the capital, ironically displacing the French-backed CFA franc. A sudden diversion on the street. It's a supply of food, and it's free. The Red Crescent relief supplies appear irregularly on the streets after being ferried southwards with Libyan assistance. Some of N'Djamena's former 200,000 population spend the day in the city and cross the river to Cameroon in the evening, simply because they are guaranteed an evening meal in the refugee camps there. On the streets like this, it's a matter of first air, first serve. Chad's problems, then, are many. President Gukuni has the problem of how not to become a Libyan pawn. Here, he says he invited the Libyans into Chad to end a rebellion. Now the job is done, they are gradually being withdrawn. Both the president and the Libyans themselves were eager to show the outside world that the troops are pulling out. It's a measure of their concern at protests voiced by the Organization of African Unity and also by Egypt, France and even the United States. It's a curious statistic that there are only about three million Libyans compared with four million Chadians. And yet Libya, under Gaddafi, with its oil wealth and Soviet arms, is by far the stronger partner in this new alliance. Gukuni is clearly indebted to Gaddafi, but many of his countrymen, including the Muslims, are concerned at the extent of the Libyan influence in Chad in the last few months. <laughs> It all depends on what Colonel Gaddafi has in mind. Here in Tobruk, he used the slogan, two countries, one people, suggesting he still seeks some form of union with Chad. Gukuni would have to enforce that, and it's doubtful that he could do it without Libyan support, which means all of Gaddafi's men are unlikely to leave Chad for some time yet.